So when it comes to something like the Ravensthorpe range and, yeah. and getting that in people's consciousness in relation to uh, future building and preferred futures, what do you see are the things that we should be focusing on? Because we, you know, our task here is to create this internal artwork for the Gene Stream Songline sculpture that is a, a yeah. progressive type of field naturalist work. What should we be putting in front of people's minds in terms of what are the key factors, components that we should, what are the ingredients we should be bringing into this? Yeah. Well, you've, prob you've probably heard these before, but it's the things that gave us what we see on these landscapes today, which is probably some of the longest continuous occupancy by organisms of a single place, be it Ravensthorpe Range. Things have come, things have gone. We know that, we know that. But a lot of things have stayed around a long time and epochs that eclipse human timeframes. Mm -hmm. So almost all of Europe and North America is post 16,000 years, it's all young stuff. So you'll yeah. go into the Rocky Mountains and you'll see those wonderful spruce forests say, oh, aren't they great? You'll see the great three and 400 year old redwoods say, aren't they fabulous? They're actually contemporary elements. They're fast growing, they're giants, they get old. But you can look at some little plants growing in the Ravensthorpe range, or you can go and see the king ears and know, not the individuals, but their lineages back 120 million years. Okay. There's, there's not. So it's this great age. But at the same time, people think well, because it's old and the soils are gutless, it was labeled useless country and gutless sands. They were the common terms and it's scrub. So they were the three things, useless soils or gutless sands and scrub. And there underpinning that was the framework of disrespect for the country. And we cleared it all. The Ramsalt range was left because it was full of toxic plants and the soils were skeletal. Otherwise it would have gone. Or if nickel, in the 1890s was as valuable as gold, the whole thing would have gone, or, and they had the technology, it would have all gone. You would not have it there today. So it's there by an accident of fate that we didn't have the contemporary tools at the time to destroy it, but we would have. What are some driving home messages that, that make this singular? What, what are the points that could stand out? What's this Ockville about that is somewhat different to the others? What, oh, um, yeah, the clear thing is the unique... Um, uh, geological substrates right yeah yeah that 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 is that's the really unique thing so we don't have height as they do in other mountain um off bills around the world like the tapui in south america but what we do have is a unique geology combined with it being a prominence so it means things have got a place to go that other things aren't going to overshadow them so if, if the rain salt rain was buried under um, 20 meters of regular loam there, there'd be nothing it'd just be you know the normal woodlands but it's a prominence it's unique and it's been ultra stable so it hasn't been known in mountain building and hasn't been under the ocean it's just it's been sitting there um, aggregating accumulating species albeit at a slow rate but because there's been no major perturbations except droughts interspersed with wet periods and species can survive a drought they can't survive an ice sheet half a kilometer deep that's what happened with the glacial periods they got rid of everything so i think the raven salt range illustrates perfectly what happens with every other prominence but the difference is it has a unique assemblage of species due to the unique geology. So that's one of the really key messages of the Ravensthorpe range. Okay, mm -hmm. excellent, excellent. Is there anywhere we could view um, so the, the collections that, um, you know, species that potentially have been lost? Are they all in the herbarium? Everything we'll find is really there, isn't it? So the Bandlup Hill stuff, mm. you, you, you Google Bandlup Hill, to find all this stuff and a whole heap of stuff will come out from the state collections. Okay. Okay. Yeah. State collections. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's the state herbarium. Yeah. Yep. The flora base is excellent. Well, right, yeah. But, but it won't list the ones that are lost because ah. you can't say that until you go back and check on it. 
But when Russell pointed out where they all were, and he said, I couldn't find them anywhere else, I said, yeah, but that's now all a big pit. And so did he <laughs> yeah, first right. take a collection, and where is that collection? Yeah, 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 all, all of the state herbarium. What's, what's the preferred future for the Ravensthorpe Range and with community participation in that? Uh, well, let's go back. Mm -hmm. Humility, humility and respect for this extraordinary ancient gift of some of the most involved evolutionary processes on earth. And um, through that respect, treating that land with the respect that it's due because it's irreplaceable. So therefore the future needs the very best science before you start doing stuff to it. You might say, oh, we're gonna get rid of Oh, we're going to plant more of these trees because we think they'll be better. We can't say, I think, because when this is gone, we're not going to get it back. And certainly no development, no mountain bike trails, no whatever. Sure, there are abandoned mine sites throughout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are abandoned mine sites. You might find some of those spots that are useful to set up interpretation centers and stuff. Um, that's what you do, but you anything natural that's left is, is totally sacred. Remember, it's got to be there for eternity. This is not, <laughs> this is not for the next decade. This is not the next term of government. This is actually eternity, and we have no concept of that in, in human timeframes. What we have today, what we degrade today is for eternity. It's not going to magically re-evolve. That's a falsehood. Clive Palmer would say that. And you know, that just shows you how much of a falsehood it would be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, we, 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 your Ravensort Range is, yeah. It might look like scrub. It might look like useless land. That is probably the very best reason to protect it in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And restoration. We do not have the technology to put back a hectare of the Ravensthorpe Range. That is a falsehood. And, and I'm an expert in it. It doesn't mean we'd, we don't try in the degraded areas to do better. That's fine. But to predicate the destruction of anything, because I get this daily. Oh, we can have that mine there. We can put that road there. We can put the housing development there because we can put better nature back on. We can put the same nature back on that bit of farmland. No, we can't. We cleared a million acres a year. We haven't been able to put back a fully competent one acre. Remember, the East is a separate country mm. ecologically to us. Mm. This is another place... And I, well, here we go. Here's a quote about this is another place and another time. Yeah, Kookaburra is a testament to that. You got it. Yeah, yep. The, yeah. Yep. Now, they might have originated here in geological history and then became extinct, but they're not welcome back here. So we, we shoot them on our property because they eat, because they're, they're a mid story predator and we don't have one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they eat the so little they take out, rains, don't they? That's oh, and we're, yep, blue wrens, all of our beautiful um, geckos, gorgeous, gorgeous stuff. So we've got uh, substantial property in our south of Perth, which is mostly wilderness forest. And, oh, gee, the kookaburras. Anyway, yeah, another I'm story. Yeah, there's not a program mm. to get them before they just oh, get out. Oh, no, of it's them. much worse. No, it's much worse. DBCA has now declared them. That's the conservation department. That do, yep, you got it. Wow, so like the like the the Brumbies thing in uh, uh you know Mount you got Park it and things right. Mm -hmm. How much how much more do we keep hurting this country? Mm. You know we've we we've, we've hurt, debilitated, and silenced the indigenous people, and we have decimated the plants and the animals, and still we have this arrogance. And and, and not yeah. listening, not listening to um, no humility. Humility is the one thing that us whiteies coming with Western economic models, yeah. that's taught out of us really, really quickly, right? Mm. And you, you, you get taught um, 
a civil respect, you know, like I say hello to you, you say hello back, we're courteous and all the rest of it. But the respect of nature and humility of nature, where nature comes first or Indigenous people come first, we are still got. We, I say to people, I, I just voted and I'm saying, God, some of the people standing out with the wrong party's posters, I'm thinking it's just they look like the 1960s, you know. Yeah. They're the people, they're the people that want to screw all of the system over. But your art's going to rescue that and your art's going to speak to it and your art will forever be the beacon. There you go. Wow. Hey, so that's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. We look at it as, as visual literacy tools. When I was at Uluru doing a project, we'd done a, a project on the, on the gene stream that are uh, related to the our species and, and looking at the different forms that our gene stream had taken through deep time and synchronizing that with the geological history of Uluru. And a teacher came in and said, oh my goodness, this is a visual literacy tool. And I'd never heard the term before. And she said, you're, you're teaching through, this is how we, we've just held a conference on, on how do we get visual literacy more so into schooling. And then wow. that was an interesting point. You know? We've got to talk, we've got to talk some more about that because we're just in a discussion with our science faculty about PhDs, because science PhDs are rigid. They are solid planks. Introduction, three experimental chapters, clear hypothesis, general discussion, bibliography, full stop, and you get examined. And life's sweet. It's the black and white. And we've got somebody who wants to do a visual and science one. And yep. the system, and they just happen to be Indigenous as well. Brilliant. And the system is like going, oh, we can't do that. And we're saying, because we have Indigenous authority, we say, yes, you can. <laughs> right? And so I think we're, we're moving in fascinating and I think encouraging areas, hopefully not that slow that it'll be too late. Exactly. Yes. We feel that like the, the nature of teaching now, I think, is missing. It's a ma ma massive component. And Linnaeus was onto it. Um, yeah, you know, he was talking about how we were all part of this tree of life, and how, and we don't have any visual tooling that enables us to actually do that. That's what I was doing at ANU before yeah. before COVID hit, and that was my pitch to those guys over there. Well, yeah, yeah. we can actually use uh, a whole toolkit for visualizing the tree of life to facilitate a conservation awareness and future building in natural yeah. systems to build yeah. systems back. That's yeah. the and, 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 and you know, in pre Linnaeus's time, we were an integral part of the tree of life because the tree of life was our supported our lives because that's how it was. Agriculture, the industrial revolution, the lack of humility for nature, and our independence of nature through abundant slavery which was free energy you know fossil first to humans then energy coal then oil nuclear whatever meant we were no longer attached to the tree of life mm. we could enjoy it but if it vanished didn't actually matter did it no it's proliferation of the right angle in middle-sized world that's the kind of way i look at it is they, they dig down if, if we become the fossils of the future and they dig down they find us they say my god these things did right angles everywhere when you build up all of these walls and stuff and you break the connect mm -hmm. connectivity awareness i mean i said that to nathan mccoy at the fitzgerald biosphere i said what's the fitzgerald biosphere teach us and he said the teachers is about connectivity and he went on to talk about the different ways the normal people had for connecting to natural systems and and that was a real like oh Wow, a wow moment for me. And, so and that was really that. critical to them. Yeah, that was really critical to them because I walk my country, you know, my big property, which is mostly wilderness forest. And you, again, it, it, and my, one of my Noongar elders said this recently. I said, what's missing in what, the way we look at nature? He says, humility. Mm. And when you have humility, you have respect. And when you have respect, you care. And when you care, you fight to protect. So it all just starts to package together. But when you don't have the humility, when you think the, the, the biosphere reserve is the museum piece and impervious to whatever we do, because it's been there for millions of years, we've made, we've lost our humility. Exactly. It's, 
Yeah. And we've got a lot of interest from our teachers, not just at the university level. There's quite a few universities that are in, interested in, in who have given us a lot of support for what we're doing, but also on the primary school level, how do we scale this? And it's awareness oh. of the younger age group so that in those early years, we're connecting yeah. that, have that emotional connection to natural systems because yeah. without that, you're lost. Perfect. Know? Yeah, to me, what we do so successfully in the sciences, so I remember being told my writing was too florid as if it was a cancer or a disease, or it meant I should go and do the arts and maybe forget science. And I was always taught the arts faculty were some sort of weirdos with very long hair. And they were actually, because I used to see them. And although I never knew any, they all confirmed that. So, you know, these uh, scholastic prejudices are embedded in the system. But what we now do with a great mind is we expunge the ability to lateralize. Yeah, compartmentalize. The ability to lateralize is great. Mm. Yeah, but what's even more interesting is when people get introduced to me and somebody uses the ridiculous professorial title, I get judged as a person where it'll be a different style of conversation. Mm. But yeah, yeah I'm, I'm an art collector, I'm a painter, I'm a calligrapher. That's because true. I do all of those things, but I hide it from my science mates because I don't have a common language in that space with them. But all my arts friends, and I'm also a garden designer because it's one of my great loves. Oh. And But I just I hide all of that from my heavy duty day discipline, which is writing books and, you know, 400 scientific papers. So, you know, the productivity is there. But if I didn't keep following that, I would just be a hypothesis-driven empirical scientist who then disengages from being part of the journey to correct the errors. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. It does go the other way as well. I remember one very pivotal discussion when I was doing my honours years ago. They said, uh, you're always in the biology school. Why are you there? You are here to mm. do art. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Why, why, why? No, that's not what I came here for I didn't get told to be like I'm because it's interesting over there I kind of blew my top out and I said because there's so many things to learn and said we yeah exactly my theory yeah. so yeah. and you know it's, it's interesting you talk about visual education you know in the sciences why does David Attenborough win well firstly everybody loves the style of his speaking mm. but it's the visuals but the visuals aren't vacuous no. they are pregnant with meaning and fact Mm. And so we already do it, but somehow that's what the BBC does, you know, but, and, and science doesn't. And we get hammered, and, and I quite enjoy doing popular stuff around my science because I find it fun weaving stories because it makes me think, uh, opens up parts of my brain. But the rest of the people around me, they will write a press release and I'll look at it and, I, and it, all of them are dry and tedious and I often say to them hey would your mum and dad pick that up and really get excited about it and they go mm, probably not but they actually don't know what to do they've lost the art in their science and mm. their art and science were intimately involved da vinci i mean look at him what yeah. did he do yeah, yeah. yeah. He was, perfect he was, mm. he was absolutely brilliant the deep time history i think you've got it and because you spent time with steve you've actually got the stuff that's it so there is low nutrients enormous stability um and lack of uh climate stringencies and we're meaning glaciers you put those three together and you get the rain sort of range you get the sterlings you get all of the stuff that we've got you get intense patterning and you get species learning you don't have to be aggressive you can live together and pack more species in by learning to to share you know like like um uh if you want to see something that'll give it to you in one um go and look at minute earth and just google the word quangan where the title of it is why are the poorest places on earth also the richest yeah mm -hmm. it's a really really good thing it's done by a mate of mine and it builds all that uh, is that hard? 
Yeah, Hans Lambers, yeah. Yeah, we've we've got a, a lot of we've done a lot of filming with Hans. We've spent a lot of time with Hans. <laughs> He's fantastic. Okay. And if I wanted to, I could bang on. Then we've got our fire friends who think everything was shaped by fire and therefore fire is the key driver of all the diversification. Therefore, fire answers everything. Of course, tell that to the Sterling course, Rangers. Yeah. Yeah. But of course, it's it's old, it's stable, it's infertile, it's adaptive strategies, it's pollination syndromes, it's lack of dispersibility. You put it all together and you leave the place alone and it's the Galapagos, except mm -hmm. it's on on steroids that's a very large version of it okay and it's gone and when it's gone we cannot rebuild it that's no. that's that's me as the chair of the society for ecological restoration the big international organization we know where you can't say restoration is going to bring it back therefore we could destroy it so take the minerals off and then we'll put the bush back and it'll all be fine that has not happened and it can't happen in very special places. So it's it's old, it's venerable. People sometimes think, oh, therefore it's a senile flora, as if you know they're in the old people's home. So let COVID in, you know, they're going to die anyway. Mm. Well, sometimes you feel that. And in in my early days as a conservation biologist in the 90s, the comment from some people, professionals, was, well, I guess they're just destined to be extinct. You know, sure, there's 2% of the habitat left because we've cleared it all. But therefore, because they didn't adapt to the bulldozer, they're destined to be extinct. Therefore, it's, you know, and, and let's face it, there's so many replacement species in the native flora. So, you know, but <laughs> how your art conveys, we have a duty of care to all the web of life and all the tree of life. Okay. That's the hard, that is the really, that is the hardest sell on the planet today. Mm -hmm. particularly the carbon economy, which is about planet, plant. So the federal department defined biodiversity as four trees, species, and that's biodiverse. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's incredible. Yeah. You get it. I get it. Yeah. But the carbon cowboys are making, are about to make a lot of money from achieving conservation co-benefits. Yeah. Which is rubbish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolute rubbish. Pirate so, labeling. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Um, so in relation to what was lost, because you, you talked to us recently about you know one just apocalyptic event to this ancient. Yeah, so I was just gonna um, oh what you, was lost? Yeah, I was gonna I, I was gonna share you just show you the, the numbers. Mm, yes, please. Now uh, see this is the data. You can see that. Yep. That's what they took out. BHP Ravensort Nickel is Bandle Uphill. Oh. Oh. You can see it for yourself. You can see it. <laughs> I mean, I Britain doesn't. So DRF has declared rare flora. They're critically endangered and likely to be extinct within a decade without care. Oh so DRF goodness. is the highest level of protection that you can get. Um, Britain has, you know, half a dozen rare species. So, you know, we, we just had these on the one hill. And what we didn't put in there was the extinct because there was a whole lot of undescribed species. Uh, yes. There. Yeah, because I was questioning the zero. I didn't quite understand what that meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we think there's about four probably in there. Now, this is how they did it, right? So that's that's the area. That was Bandle Uphill, left just like the Ravensort Range. So there is a parallel story because it's just down the road. This is, this is um, uh, towards Esperance. So you can see all the clearing. Um, to the left is some fire scars. This is a hill left, you know, full of poison, skeletal sores and all the rest. So this is what we compiled together. And you'll see them when they start moving in on that area. And then suddenly you'll start to see the clearing. Then they wake up lots of rare species. Oh, mm -hmm. God, we better clear it real quick. Oh, my goodness. And start, yeah, and they just start doing it, right? Mm. Oh, <laughs> Oh my goodness. So there you go. And they've done more clearing, but we've managed to block the last sort of 25% of the area um, right. because they claimed, and this goes to something I heard you saying, they claimed, oh, uh, we can restore it. And I've just said to the regulators, prove it from what they have already done. Yep. 
and that's gone all silent. But I don't trust them at all. So this was the, this is from the newspaper. Um, uh, Ravenstalk closure leaves scar on land. So that's when first quantum metals walked away because they're going bankrupt. And that's what we were left with. That was the whole, that's Bandle Uphill. That's Ravensthorpe Range. See what I mean? If, if we had the tech in the 1890s, there would be no Ravensthorpe Range. July, and it's restarted in 2019. Who knows? Uh, First Quantum will probably get out of jail completely on this one because I'll say it was somebody else did the clearing. That's why it okay. was sold by BHP because they had cleared ahead of the environmental approvals. So therefore you didn't have any environmental approval impediments in the sale. It's an old practice that mining industry do. If they're ready to pack up a mine and they think they can get away with it, they'll clear a very large footprint and sell it as a shovel ready project. Mm. Mm. There you go. Bit, wow. That's me. Mm -hmm. old. Wow. And you're talking about the extinct species. Did you say something about five? About, about four uh -huh. to five. About four to five species, we suspect. Um, and, and they and, were said. They would. Okay. And can you just explain uh, um, how you suspect that they are ah, now extinct? Because the person that did all this, this survey work for me was the person on this slide, Russell Barrett, one of the great botanists in West Australia. He was my PhD student. Um, a pathological predilection for extensive, intensive, detailed collecting. <laughs> Russell comes back and says, this is new. I have questioned him on a couple of occasions. You learn very quickly not to question Russell. He knows the country. So when he came back, I'm going, really? He said, yeah, yeah, there's probably a lot more stuff there. I want to go back. Mm -hmm. um, it's just because the area, that is one hilly prominence, like the Ravensort Range, but with a unique geology, unlike the barrens, you know, because they're quartzite, mm -hmm. different set of species. Yeah. This aggregates, as I said yesterday, aggregates a range of species that have adapted to live in those environments. And so they're just the most fabulous, unique evolutionary experiments on these ridges and hills. And Bandalup was a subset. Because it was isolated from Ravensthorpe, we, you rarely get genetic mixing so it meant you essentially had island number one you would have had valleys of woodlands different soils species can't move through those woodlands then the Ravensthorpe range splendid isolation its species then you have the next prominences which are all the barrens different rock material so you might have been adapted there but there would have been species already pre-adapted to those um, uh, siliceous soils and they'd sit on those ones. So the whole thing is this glorious um, uh, tapestry of rich diversity, but all it's like um, one of those complex Persian carpets. You've got to go in and you've got to read little sections of it, and then you start finding the richness in there. When you pull out, it's just a carpet, you know, with a pattern on it. But when you go in, the richness is in the detail. And our flora is full of that stuff. More, <laughs> more than anyone in the early botanical world knew so when i started botany just as an example um i i started in 1972 and my lecture on the diversity of western australia said there were 3200 native species in western australia of plants and they said isn't it rich and i said my gosh isn't that good so we're well over 12,000 now yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. so it shows we probably have a lot more than that, but we've already cleared such vast areas. We've, we've lost stuff before we could find them. Yeah, I remember seeing a million acres a year and it changed absolutely everything for me. I, I was like horrified. You know, the Keith Bradbury uh, presented yep. documentary a million acres a year. And, uh, and after that, oh, no. it was only a few days later, I went and spent a day with Steve Hopper and uh, up on and introduced to the Ockbills and Yodfells. And then... Um, yeah, I went out to Wave Rock with Arnie Carol Peterson uh, following that and going through the wheat belt and then climbing up on Wave Rock, I swore there'll be no more artist residencies until I built gene streams. I can't, I have to build gene streams. We have to try to develop a system by which we can bring people into a visual and awareness of connectivity between all of these things and make it something that each community can contribute to. 
So that's yeah. that's the process that we're on now. But it had a pivotal, uh, you know, that that insight on the loss of the depth of deep time, what deep time can deliver if it's got the time to create this kind of magnificent diversity and then just to lose it all in this giant like apocalyptic Leap. like ice age type Leap. bang. Yeah, it's, it's like yeah. An ice an ice age goes a lot slower than the two hundred years since invasion. Mm -hmm. And Ice Age does give species a chance to escape. You're right. You're talking about a thousand years. Yeah. Imagine if we did what we did over the thousand years. Mm. Of course, we would have learned along the way. Yeah. And we would have said, we don't, want, we don't want to lose those bilbies. They're really important for tilling mm. the soil. But we just didn't care. Yeah. And um, that's, that's what we're left with. Um, it's extraordinary to look inside of the tree of life. And, and um, I remember uh, one talk we gave, we were saying that, you know, extinction six doesn't look like the other big extinctions. Wherever you go, the, the actual shape of it within the tree of life, it looks very, very different. Steve, Steve was the one who opened all of our eyes to, you need, you need experimental evidence. And experimental evidence on what drives diversification is, is a tough gig. Mm -hmm. And I can show, because I work in pollination ecology, that pollination has driven this extraordinary diversity. Yeah. Okay. So that, that, that's the other one. It, it's there by a sheer accident. Now, the Stirling Ranges was different. Very early on, the 1920s or 30s, whenever it was made, they realised it was our only mountain peak. And if they didn't put something around it, people would destroy it. You know, they'd take the few trees, they'd burn it, they'd put stock in it, they'd kill it. And so there were these very rare, they're like Yellowstone, which is one of the first national parks. People just said, this is, this is, this is something in the US that is so unique. They didn't know about World Heritage. We now call them World Heritage areas. And the Stirlings is in fact World Heritage. Bremer, Fitzgerald is World Heritage. We just don't know it because somehow we want some spectacular geyser or a volcano or you know, the world's highest mountain or something, but it's all sitting there, you know, knee-high rainforest, extraordinary diversity. Nowhere else on the planet will you find another Ravensthorpe range. There's one, and that's it. 